I'm going to talk about the Paris Agreement today and I think I will give you some ideas that you perhaps had not thought about before. So um, I am Michelle Sterling, the Communications Manager for Friends of Science Society and the last time that I saw Paris was in 1972 when I was working there as an au pair girl. Um, I never dreamed that Paris would be central to my life many years later, but here I am and here we are. So um, let's talk climate targets, accountability law, and must we meet Paris targets? And will low carbon policies actually do anything for the climate? So Green New Deal, Resilient recovery, climate accountability law, children's climate trials, carbon taxes, pipeline blockadia, clean fuel standards. What do all these things have in common? The Paris Agreement. So all of them are premised on the notion that Canada must meet the Paris Agreement greenhouse gas reduction targets and that by doing so we'd be saving the planet, stopping climate change and extreme weather. And none of this is true. The Paris Agreement. Every one of the preceding organizations claims that we must implement laws and carbon taxes or cap and trade so that we will meet the Paris Agreement targets. But what exactly does the Paris Agreement oblige us to? Um, not much. There's no requirement to meet any specific GHG emissions reduction target. There is no requirement to um, pay any penalty if we don't meet the voluntary emissions targets. There's no requirement to pay any specified amount or share of collective financing for developing countries. And there's no requirement to use any specific set of policy instruments like taxes, regulations, subsidies in pursuing our voluntary emissions reductions goals. So that is from Robert Lyman's recent report, Litigating Climate in Canada. And I'll refer you to many of his excellent reports in this overview. He was a former public servant at the federal level for 27 years and a diplomat for 10 years. Most of his life he worked on this GHG file. And he has insights that are not talked about in the media because you know the media has a lockout on climate information. So what, what would happen if we tried to meet the Paris Agreement targets? This is what would happen. This is what is happening. And why, um, you know, no other country is attempting this scale of national economic suicide to appease a piece of paper. Only Canada. From the Rio Earth Summit in 1992 until today, Global fossil fuel consumption has risen 57%. On the left, you can see a graph by Roger Pielke Jr. of the US, where he has outlined the rise in fossil fuel use and what it would take to meet the supposed objectives of a Paris compliant or net zero world. And on the right, there's a chart from BP showing that renewables contribute almost nothing to the world energy and oil, gas, and coal continue to rise in demand and they drive our economy and there is a section there for biofuels and then biomass that's that's the fuel that poor peasants use in subsistence countries dung wood where they live really hand to mouth and something like two billion people are living like that how have countries done all the countries that signed on to paris you know, there's no obligation to meet any targets, but all of the countries who signed on are obliged to report every five years. So last year in August, Robert Lyman did this report, Promises versus Performance, and it catches up with the countries at the uh, five-year reporting mark. And you can see China's emissions are up 28%. India's emissions up 69%. South Korea up 25%. Iran and Saudi Arabia up 30 and 35 percent respectively. And who has reduced emissions? The United States by 9 percent and they pulled out of Paris. And the European Union by 16 percent but they're facing an industrial massacre because of it. And Russia is down a smidge, South Korea down 10 percent and bad guy Canada. We went up 
one whole percent. Our population was 33 million in 2008 and 37 million a uh, decade later. So that's a 12% increase. And yet our emissions only grew by 1%. So we're called a climate laggard. What's up with that? So if we look at Robert Lyman's report, Futile Folly, it explains that China emits more in one month than Canada does all year. So even if Canada was instantly wiped off the map, it would make no difference to the world in terms of meeting the Paris targets. Well, surely if all countries met the targets and Canada did its fair share, then we'd see a reversal of global warming, right? Well, nope. Bjorn Lomborg used the IPCC's own computer simulation, MAGIC is what it's known as, and ran the numbers and found that if every country did their bit, um, there would only be 17 hundredths of a degree Celsius reduction in warming by 2100. That's uh, um, three tenths of a degree Fahrenheit. And that's if everyone did their bit. But it would cost between one to two trillion dollars a year for nothing. So by contrast, Lomberg says that if we just applied a few billion to lifting the poor out of poverty, and to providing developing nations with grid scale energy, and proper sanitation and water, we could make the world a better place for almost everyone. And his new book, False Alarm, explains all of this and also explains how nonsensical present policies are. So other climate leaders are cited as examples to follow. Many of the recent Canadian reports that are pushing for climate accountability law um, say we should look at other countries as uh, climate leaders in this regard. But what do we find? Even the largest of these countries, Germany, is tiny compared to Canada. And all of them are located in far more temperate parts of the world. Canada is the second largest, coldest country in the world. We produce resources for the rest of the world. Our challenges are unique. And if anything, the Paris Agreement or any global carbon tax or climate accountability law is extremely discriminatory against Canada, against you. So you will not find this temperature differential in many countries of the world. Canadians' lives are at stake. Canada has a 50 degrees Celsius temperature differential over the year. Fossil fuel use and development is vital to our survival and our economy. And environmental groups claim that Canada has done nothing to meet the climate and Paris targets, the ones that are, we're not required to meet anyway. Um, but obviously that's not true. From 1990 to 2020, Canada's population grew by 37%. But look at the dotted line there for our emissions. It's almost flat. Obviously Canada has instituted more energy efficiencies in our emitting industries and our way of life. So we have done well. Now, most Canadians are unaware that Canada already has more than 600 GHG reduction incentive laws and programs. These are at combined federal, provincial, and municipal levels. More than 600. It's all right there in Robert Lyman's report on carbon taxation in Canada. Likewise, climate activists claim that we need more of a robust carbon tax, more than $30. But in terms of Canada's combined fuel taxes, we're already paying the equivalent of $192 a ton carbon tax equivalent. And that was before the April 1st, 2020 rise in the carbon tax rate. So a fuel tax is a form of a carbon tax. So Canada pays a very high carbon tax it's killing our competitiveness. How did we get this way? And, and how about carbon taxes in the rest of the world? Well, something like 40 countries have carbon taxes, ranging from the average $8 a ton, and that's like $2 a ton in China to about $80 a ton in Sweden, which runs mostly on nuclear. And of course, $0 a ton in the USA, which is our largest trading partner. So Canada's high carbon tax is killing our economy. And what has created climate hysteria? 
Well, these billionaire foundations fund environmental groups worldwide to push for global cap and trade, carbon taxes, and renewables, and they claim it's to save the planet. So since about 2005, a group of green billionaire foundations have funded environmental groups worldwide for hundreds of millions of dollars every year to phase out coal, attack oil and gas, and to advocate for global cap and trade, a price on carbon, and their vested interests in renewables. They picked up on the early work of Enron, which had seen the 1997 Kyoto Accord as a fantastic business opportunity nothing to do with climate. And it, that was outlined in the Palmasano memo, memo, which you can find online. So Enron had made billions on wind, natural gas, and carbon trading, and Enron also had employed environmental groups as proxies to get the public on board for the policies that they wanted. And the goal of the green billionaires here was to create global cap and trade systems and the wind and solar generate the tradable renewable energy certificates. So these are like, you know, monopoly money certificates. But that creates a whole other level of economy that, of course, you can't participate in, by the way. So the tar sands campaign against Alberta appears to have been a subset of this program. Now, uh, from about 1970 to about 1990, carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere and global temperatures were rising almost in lockstep. So it was, uh, you know, it was a pretty safe assumption that carbon dioxide was driving that trend. But in 2013, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change found that there had been a hiatus in global warming since before Kyoto, despite a significant rise in human industrial carbon dioxide emissions. So um, that was not widely reported in the media. In 2014, Judith Curry testified to the US Senate that um, carbon dioxide is not the control knob that can fine tune climate, meaning that reducing carbon dioxide will not change the temperature. So you would think that the world would have rejoiced. That should have been front page news. No more climate crisis. But in 2014, two green billionaires sponsored a project to promote the scariest climate projection of all, the RCP 8.5, it's called. And you can see it there at the top. Now, these are computer simulations that a combination of climate scientists and economists ran, and they were trying to figure out what are the factors that drive climate change. This was never, ever intended for policy making, but that's how it's being used. And this risky business report has circulated in all the financial circles. This is the report that Mark Carney cites whenever he's talking about the tragedy of the horizon. You know, it's going to be a catastrophe 100 years from now. We must act now. Well, it, it's based on a, a completely wildly exaggerated model that, um, you know, probably would use more coal than there is on the planet. And Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, in her recent Alberta's Climate Future report, does exactly this. She runs a comparison between the 8.5 and the 4.5 scenario, as if one is business as usual and the other is a safe path. So, is there a climate catastrophe imminent? No. This is probably confusing for many of you because I'm telling you we have no particular obligations under the Paris Agreement, but every climate activist swears that there's an imminent climate catastrophe. But when you look at this screenshot from a presentation by Dr. John Christie at the University of Huntsville, Alabama, you can see the comparison of climate models, these are computer simulations, to the observed temperatures. The gray bars closest to Dr. Christie are the observed temperatures. The higher bars are the modeled projections, and the one in the square box in the middle is the Canadian climate model, the hottest one of all. So that's not what climate policy should be predicated on, because it's science fiction, it's not science fact. So now we have curious climate geopolitics, and I'm going to suggest to you that it's important to think of the climate issue as a geopolitical issue and not anything to do with the environment or the climate. So even though the U.S. is our largest trading partner and friend, knowing that the U.S. had pulled out of the Paris Agreement, Canada made a climate deal with France 
Um, Canada's largest trading partner is the US. We have more than $600 billion of imports and exports. But in April 2018, about the time that Kinder Morgan suspended work on the Trans Mountain expansion, the Prime Minister of Canada went to France and made a climate deal with Emmanuel Macron. This was intended to be a two-year deal, so I don't know what the status is right now or when it's supposed to end, but there was almost no coverage of this in the press. This deal jointly binds France and Canada to push car carbon and climate policies worldwide. So Canada-France trade, just to put it in perspective, is about $16 billion dollars versus $600 billion. France made a climate law. In France, in about 2015, 2016, they made a climate law that affected all of their global assets. And of course, many Canadian companies, especially the transnational ones, are far more deeply embedded in France and in Europe than in Canada. And these would be companies like Power Corporation, Bombardier, Caisse de Depot, um, McCain, um, you can, you can find them on the Canadian government website, but uh, you know, they're, they're companies that generally come home to Canada to collect a subsidy and then go back to doing business elsewhere. So obviously all of their business interests in Europe were deeply affected by this French climate law. But who cares, right? Let France make these crazy climate laws. What, what does it matter to us? Well, France is the center of an organization called La Francophonie, which is a collection of French language nations that is made up of about 88 countries of the world on five continents and combined represents a population of one billion people. So when they go to the UN, they got lots of people they can draw favors on. So I wonder what President Trump thought. <laughs> So in February of 2018, President Macron told President Trump, no Paris Agreement, no EU trade agreement. And two months later, our Prime Minister signs a climate deal with France. Note that France imports a lot of oil for refining, almost all of it from despot nations. And note that the French oil giant Total pulled out of the oil sands for the most part and invested in gas in Iran. So Canada had signed a trade deal with Europe called CETA. It was signed in 2016 and it came into force in September 2017. So geopolitics matter more than climate. That's my point here. Now if you look at this list of the uh, top 11 um, countries with large reserves of oil and gas, um, there's only two democracies on there, Canada and the US. So would the rest of the industrial world buy oil from these other despot nations? And why would they want competitors like us on the market? Which of these competitor nations observes the GHG reduction targets of the Paris Agreement? Anyone? Not one. Yeah, not one. So Europe itself is a um, highly industrial region, in industrialized region, and a global carbon tax would be a handy equalization payment for them, don't you think? Because who does the Paris Agreement benefit? Well, when we switch gears from Robert Lyman's reports for a minute, we see that um, uh, many different parties have interests in some way and some may not be obvious. For instance, uh, Europe has poor oil and gas reserves and William Kay reports that they import about 600 billion in fossil fuels a year. And you can see that a lot of oil and gas comes from Russia and they don't seem to have any pipeline blockade going on over there. So this outflow of money will destroy them. However, if we had to pay a global carbon tax, that would be a form of equalization payment. So it's really, you know, the whole climate issue is really about areas of the world that are rich in fossil fuels versus areas of the world that are poor or empty of fossil fuels. So start looking at the news in that way, start looking at treaties in that way. So. You might not know it, but Canada and China also have a climate deal. And this was signed in November of 2018. And you might wonder why, why, would, why would China sign a climate deal when they're the world's largest emitter? Well, the answer is this. The Green Climate Fund has promised $100 billion a year to developing nations with no accountability for that money. 
The Green Climate Fund was the bribe to get all the developing nations of the world on board with the Paris Agreement. But President Trump saw that it would mostly be milking US dollar bills from the Treasury, so he pulled out of Paris. And you can see why. Rich countries like Saudi Arabia can apply for green climate funds for development. Meanwhile, bankrupt Western countries like Greece are required to pay in. And there's no accountability, as I said. So this, the report Futile Folly that I mentioned earlier, and that has a link in this report, um, has a list of the payments, and that the payments intended from these, the Western countries are, are staggering. They're in the billions and billions of dollars. And also, it really boils down to who cuts and who pays. So this is another great report by Robert Lyman, even though it's a couple of years old. So what about the climate emergency? Where did that come from? Well, the Club of Rome propagates the story that there's a climate emergency, and their scientific source is what's called the Potsdam Institute for Climate Research in Germany, or PICS. And PICS works closely with the World Council on Sustainable Business Development, which is sort of an umbrella of about 100 companies, but beneath it I think there's something like, uh, well, there's sev several thousand. I'm not going to quote the figure. We should look it up. Um, and the Club of Rome is based in Switzerland, where much of the world's money sloshes around in discrete accounts. And it works with a group based in Germany, which has invested billions of dollars in wind and solar as the solution for climate change. So of course they want to keep that narrative alive, and climate emergency does that. And you can see this Swedish climate scientist Johan Rockström, who works with PICS, he wants a $400 a ton global carbon tax law. And it seems that the climate emergency actually is really only about money. The Club of Rome's plan is really just about throwing more money. And by the way, Club of Rome has been wrong with their doom and gloom predictions ever since 1971. <laughs> um, so the picture of Johan Rockström is from the Swedish government's website, you know, Greta's hometown, and he's their featured image. Now, Rockstrom also advocates for rapid decarbonization. This is like the net zero 2050. But he's not an engineer. Uh, but Professor Michael J. Kelly of Cambridge is an engineer, and he's shown that wind and solar cannot support even basic society. There's not enough energy return on energy invested. And rapid decarbonization would cause mass deaths. So why are these common sense cautions ignored? As usual, money talks. Um, the UNPRI, which is called uh, the United Nations Principle for Responsible Investment, and the ESG guru pictured here are driving climate change hysteria. The UNPRI is about 1,000 signatories holding $90 trillion in assets under management. These are pension funds, institutional investors, and the UNPRI is a transnational, unelected, unaccountable group. Those green billionaires got almost all the institutional investors and pension funds of the world to sign on to the UNPRI, and it's climate obsessed. So these are also union pension funds. So when people wonder why there's this tremendous push on climate hysteria, you have large contingencies of unions being directed by their management because their funds are invested in these um, programs running through the UNPRI. So, and Andrew Lawton earlier spoke about the fact that the media is not covering stories on Alberta or on climate. Well, these same institutional investors own much of the major media. And in Canada, NEI Investments, which is all of the credit unions of Canada and Desjardins, told Rogers Media, Bell Media, and the big five banks to toe the line on Paris and the Ecofiscal Commission on Carbon Tax. So that might explain some of the censorship. So the financial community is driving a climate change agenda that you have to pay for. And you can see here some transnational corporations stand to make a bundle. This 2007 PowerPoint slide indicated that through a UN policy on carbon trading, the World Bank and a private fund made $1.2 billion in 23 minutes trading on pollution from a plant in China. So this is literally trading in hot air. And you can see why there are many powerful forces pushing this agenda worldwide. But many developing nations are getting fed up with not getting 
the promised Green Climate Fund money from the West. And in fact, last fall in September, China and India sent a letter separately to the UN Climate Confab saying, pay up. So, and in, the, in December, right after that, uh, the COP25 Confab in, in uh, Madrid, they were supposed to come to an agreement on international emissions trading and it fell apart over that negotiation, but that would have instituted a global carbon tax law, which is something we must do everything in our power to avoid and prevent. So what about Alberta? You know, people like to say, oh, you guys are, you know, a bunch of rednecks, the deniers, everything. Why do we resist? Well, Alberta did due diligence on the climate and environment issue in 2000, and it resulted in this legislation. And in uh, 2000, they had contracted Dr. Madhav Kandekar, our scientific advisor, uh, to review the GHG theory of climate change for the Alberta government. And uh, he found that there are many uncertainties. And in fact, I interviewed him in 2018, and he said there are many uncertainties in the climate change greenhouse gas theory. And he said now, 18 years later, there are many more. Um, so we also have the highest per capita ratio of earth scientists and professional engineers in Alberta, and all of them know that climate models are not representative of reality. So in 2019, a new group was formed in Holland called Clintel for Climate Intelligence, and it's a group of 900 scientists from around the world, and they have written letters, registered letters to the UN, the EU, and WEF, saying that the science is not settled, because that's a fundamental premise of the Paris Agreement. And so they say there's no climate emergency. Natural factors, like the sun, affect climate more than human factors. That we do have time, and that net zero 2050 would be a catastrophe. We are in kind of a global conundrum, because the financial community is going one way on climate emergency, and the scientific evidence is going the other, showing that it's all a false alarm. And actually, Robert Lyman has written this up in a great report called When Climate Prophecy Fails. And he notes that when reality fails to match prophecy, those who follow climate and energy policy developments closely will see that the rationale for drastic transition crumble. The Canadian public, unfortunately, may not react until climate taxes and other measures impose intolerable costs on the average person, and we do not have a crystal ball for that. And the second report pictured here is our rebuttal report to Dr. Catherine Hayhoe's report on Alberta's climate future. So climate prophecy has failed, and I've tried to show you some of the competing forces, global forces, and why they support the Paris Agreement, but it's not about saving the planet. So in fact, Canada's future is at stake. Remember that in the Paris Agreement, there is no requirement to meet any specific GHG emission reduction target, no requirement to pay any penalty if we fail to meet voluntary emission reduction targets, no requirement to pay any specific amount or share of collective financing for developing nations, and no requirement to use any specific set of policy instruments like taxes, regulations, or subsidies in pursuing those voluntary emission targets. But many competing global political, geopolitical forces are trying to coerce you into giving up our vast riches and ransoming our children's future with carbon policies that will make green crony capitalists rich and leave all of you in carbon serfdom. So it's going to be hard to do, but just say no. And as Catherine McKenna likes to say, hard things are hard. <laughs> Thank you.